Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn, and I'm thrilled to have with me today, Robert Wright. Uh, Robert is the founder of Superhero Legal, an intellectual uh, property legal firm helping entrepreneurs and business owners figure out what to do with all of this content and product and uh, everything else with value that they're creating. So, uh, Robert, it's wonderful having you here today. Hey, well, Nick, thanks for having me. Great to be on the show and can't wait to uh, talk some IP with you. Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. So, Robert, for people who don't know about you and your work, could you just give us a brief background as to where you got started and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I kind of trace my my uh, start in the law all the way back to early days, you know, growing up as a kid. My mom would constantly have kind of courtroom dramas playing on the TV show. So a lot of Matlock, a lot of Perry Mason. And uh, I think that just kind of seeped into me from an early day, er, early days. I just always thought courtroom stuff was really interesting Fast forward, you know, take that to college when you're actually trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. And uh, I was in college, this is going to date me a bit, but like at the heyday of Napster, when, you know, file sharing was a thing, the internet was just becoming what it's now become. And it was great. I mean, I thought Napster was about the coolest thing in the world. Instead of going down, you know, to the store and, you know, putting down $20 for a horrible CD where there was like one or two songs that you actually liked, um, you could just share music with your friends. And that was, that was quite lovely. And my music collection grew uh, quite extensively, as did a lot of other people that I, that I knew at the time. Um, as we all know now, that was not, uh, that, that was not long lasting. Uh, you know, the recording industry came in and said, yeah, file sharing, that's, that's not cool. That's not a good thing. That is, that's theft, that's stealing, that's copyright infringement. And, you know, Napster shut down, file sharing really kind of hit a road bump. And I was, I was just fascinated by the whole thing, right? Because I, I really had this mindset of, well, it's just, it's just sharing, right? I've got these songs and I'm sharing them with you and you're sharing with me. And they tell you day one of kindergarten, you're supposed to share with your friends. What's wrong with this? And so as I, as I went into law school, I was just, I really wanted to explore that. And so started to kind of peel back the layers of the onion a bit and learned that, well, we're talking about copyright and here's what copyright is and here's what it gives authors and here's the creative process. And oh, by the way, you know, that's, that's a lot of blood, sweat and tears. And by just sharing, quote unquote, you're actually stealing and that's not a good thing. And so um, that just really kind of set me down the road of wanting to understand intellectual property, of wanting to understand as you create, whether it's music or as movies, books, courses, PDF guides, whatever it is, like the, you know, the fruit of your intellectual labor, how does the law respect that? How does the law protect that? And uh, you know, when I hung my shingle, I saw a great need for you know creators, you know people who, you know they they you know were creating their their maybe it's a side hustle startup, maybe they're growing in a young company, but they 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 had something in terms of asset creation, but they didn't necessarily have have a ton of money in the coffers. They didn't want a traditional law firm experience. They didn't want to go you know downtown to the big fancy law firm. They didn't want to do kind of a self-service sort of thing like the legal Zoom. They, they actually wanted to speak to somebody and get questions answered. And so uh, that was really kind of the role that I, I started to fill early days with my virtual shingle. I've never had a traditional brick and mortar. I've always had an online presence uh, with a real heart and a real focus on helping entrepreneurs, again, those creators that they've got something and they don't really know what to do with it, how to protect it. And uh, I tell you what, it's it's been an absolute blast helping folks. Let's uh, hopefully help some folks today. Uh, oh. Maybe just by starting out with the basics. Uh, maybe some of the the listeners already know all about this, but there might be one or two who don't know the difference between the different types of intellectual property. What exactly does it mean? Uh, what are the different types there are, and what do you need to do to get the protection from those different types? 
Oh, it's, it's great. I mean, that's a huge question, but it's, you know, the basics are, are really good. So intellectual property itself actually doesn't mean anything. It's kind of this broad umbrella under which you have some very distinct types of protection, right? You have trademarks. That's the first type of intellectual property. We're talking about names, logos, slogans, anything that you're putting on a product or a service, getting it to market and trying to distinguish your offering from everybody else, right? When I think about trademarks, I think about Nike because it's just the, the simplest, best example. There's Nike, the brand name. There's the iconic Nike swoosh. There's the just do it tagline. All of those are stuck on shoes and shirts and duffel bags and all sorts of random stuff that Nike sells. That, what we're talking about there is trademark law. You don't have to register a trademark to have one. As soon as you put a mark on a product or a service, you get it to market. You have rights in the geographic area where you sell. Now, the problem with the internet becomes, well, where do you sell? You kind of sell everywhere, but not really anywhere. And so the best way to clarify that, to not have these little geographic pockets of, of influence or, or rights, is to go ahead and register your mark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office as soon as you do the United, entire United States, regardless of where you're selling, becomes your sphere of influence. So you don't have to register to have a trademark, but it's certainly recommended uh, for sure. Copyrights you know, kind of go the other direction. We're talking about works of authorship, original works of authorship. Typically, it's going to be things like music and movies and writings and poetry and painting. It's anything that you're taking brush to canvas, finger to keyboard, um, you know, pen to paper. There's some sort of you know, creative process that, that's happened and occurred. Uh, you have a copyrightable asset, right? Copyright law is very interesting in that um, you know, copyright vests with the author, meaning whoever is the artist, right? The person putting brush to canvas owns the copyright. And as we create things ourselves in our business, that's not an issue at all where we can find ourselves into a little bit of trouble is when we actually hire somebody to help us create things for our business. So we go to a photographer to take some product photos for us. We go to somebody to have a logo created. We go to somebody to have a PDF document written. All of a sudden we're paying the bill for the person holding the, the brush to canvas, but we're not actually that person. And so we have to make sure that we get the proper agreement in place. We need a copyright assignment agreement in place such that the copyright doesn't remain back with the author. It's actually transferred over to us, the person paying the bill. And so one of the biggest missteps I see with clients that I support as it relates to copyright is not so much you know, firming up ownership of, of materials that they create, but it's when they go and hire freelancers, they hire someone who's not an employee, really dotting the I's and crossing the T's there to make sure that they, you know, clear title of that copyright is coming over to us. You don't have to register a copyright to have one, uh, but you really can't do much with it until you do. So it is highly recommended that you go ahead and register. It's going to be, you know, kind of prima facie evidence that you are in fact the owner. It's going to allow you to sue people if that's something that you're looking to pursue. You can't get into federal court without it. Uh, and if you do it early days, there's a number of advantages. You don't actually have to show harm to be able to recover monetary damages. You can get attorney's fees paid. And so, again, it's one of those things, if you're really serious about scaling a balanced business, whether you're selling physical products or maybe you've got courses or other types of content that you're creating, you know, having those, those physical assets, but also the intangible assets protected vis-a-vis uh, -vis copyrights are a really smart thing to do, kind of just as normal part and process of growing and scaling the business. As we work down the rest of the intellectual property path, we have patents. There's two types. You have design patents and you have utility patents. Design patents protect kind of the functional design aspects of an item, right? Uh, before we jumped on the uh, podcast today, I was, I was with a client and they were looking at a product. It was a physical product that they were going to start selling in their business. They were kind of looking and researching the competition. competition and effectively, it was a, it was a piece of rubber. And I'm not going to go into specific details, but it was effectively a piece of rubber and it had kind of a, a pattern on it such that it created friction as the, as the rubber would move across the ground. No one owns a, a piece of rubber, right? But there are some design aspects, some design choices, some functional design choices as to the pattern of, that, of those friction points. And so we were talking about, listen, if you want to sell a piece of rubber, you're going to have to have a different pattern. And here's how you would navigate that because 
while this particular competitor didn't seem to have a design patent, we were doing some diligence. Um, I, we know enough of, about what could be design patentable that we just want to avoid that altogether. And so they're going to go off and create presumably some sort of different friction pattern, which is, again, part of the fun of my job. You're talking to people selling pieces of rubber, which is cool. Um, and then there's utility patents, which protect the usefulness of an item, the way that an item works. Now, typically, you know, we're talking about, you know, business methods or ways that things function. I mean, that's the real inventive, you know, kind of Thomas Edison type stuff, uh, depending upon what you're doing in your business. Uh, you may or may not, you know, kind of go down that path. One of the things that I've seen specifically with patents, it seems like most folks, they get the logo and, you know, the value of a brand and kind of how to protect that. The copyright, you know, aspect of things, there's always a little bit of education that has to happen. And then there's always, hey, you ought to register, you know, and getting, you know, kind of doing that gentle nudge to, to really firm that up. With patents, my experience has been, there's kind of this, this, uh, this hesitancy of, or, or this interest of, I'm going to go patent because patents is this amazing, great thing. But what folks don't realize is that it's a really expensive proposition and you really have to be kind of prepared with, well, what's the ROI, you know, kind of a, a, a very basic, simple sort of utility patent is, is easily $10,000. And for a lot of smaller folks that are just starting out, they might have something that's very interesting, but $10,000 is going to be a big chunk of whatever capital they have kind of getting started in their business that, you know, they may or may not be prepared to kind of receive on the other end of things. Um, so, you know, patent certainly worthwhile exploring, but it is one of those things you really have to, you have to have a plan, you have to be ready for it, and you have to understand it is a, it is a lengthy process. And part of the deal that you make with the federal government to get a patent, because you have to file it, till you file it, you don't have anything, you're giving up the goods. You are telling anybody who is skilled in the art, meaning they you know, have kind of that same skill set that you have, exactly how you do what you do. You're basically giving others the recipe. In exchange for that, you're getting a monopoly. With design patents, you're getting 15 years of a monopoly. With utility, you're getting 20. Um, but it's also going to take a while for that patent to actually issue. And oh, by the way, while you're in market, competitors are going to come a calling. They're going to start trying to take your market share. And so you're going to be left with a good bit of cleanup that needs to happen once that patent issues. And so as I, as I work with folks specifically kind of in the patent realm of things, it is, it is always that conversation of getting the patent is step one of the process, but step two is, okay, what are we going to do to make sure that we kind of clean up this mess that's been, you know, created, you know, while we've waited for the prosecution of the process uh, patent to play out? And uh, do we have the money to do that? Because, oh, by the way, that's not an inexpensive proposition either. And so it's really patents are one of those really, really interesting things as we think about kind of that broader spectrum of intellectual property. I will throw in kind of as, as that last bit of IP is the, is the good old fashioned trade secret. Uh, it is the black sheep of the intellectual property family. Not a lot of people talk about it, presumably because it doesn't have extensive use, but I always highlight it because I do think it's important trade secrets, you know, as you have something that is unique, novel, non-obvious, different, you have the choice of patenting it and getting that monopoly, or you can put it under lock and key, keep it sealed and protect it under trade secret. The advantage of that is as long as it is trade secreted, as long as you're able to kind of keep it under lock and key, you have it. There is no you know, shelf life. Uh, typically, we see this with recipes, the formula for Coca-Cola, Bush's baked beans, you know, the Colonel's uh, secret blend of herbs and spices for Kentucky Fried Chicken, certainly a lot of applicability to the food side of things, but there are certain business methods that could be trade secretable as well. And so I bring that up just because people don't normally talk about it. They talk about trademarks and copyrights and patents because there's registrations that occur. But uh, I do think depending upon the nature of your business, the trade secret can actually be a really interesting way to protect whatever it is that, that kind of makes your business special. So there's, there's obviously a lot in there. And uh, a lot of very large companies put a huge amount of emphasis on uh, registering basically everything. Some companies have thousands of new patents every year. Uh, they, they trademark every product idea they can come up with. Uh, but let's talk about the, the entrepreneurs and maybe the, the smaller uh, companies out there. What, what exactly does this protection bring you? And I think that's one of the the big uh, 
misunderstandings that a lot of people have about intellectual property. Let's say you have the trademark or you have the copyright or you have the patent. Does that mean you're set for life and no one can copy you? Or what exactly does it bring? It kind of, it kind of depends. I mean, I, I think when you look at intellectual property in any, any form or fashion, you have to look at it as an asset in your business. So I work with a number of folks that whether, you know, some are very purposeful to say, listen, I'm going to scale this e-com business over the next two years, and then I'm going to exit for whatever I can get for it, and then I'm going to go off and do the other thing. They're, they're the true entrepreneur that wanders from, you know, venture to venture to venture, right? And so that, as, uh, that asset side of things as it relates to IP is, is very front of mind for them, right? Uh, and then there are folks that they just kind of stumble into acquisition or sale, this is really happening on the Amazon, you know, private label space right now, where people are just kind of these large aggregators are just knocking on sellers' doors to say, hey, we've seen your stuff online and you seem to sell a lot. Would you want to sell? And, you know, that asset that, you know, the copyright ownership of the product photos or the, the, the product detail page, uh, listing the brand name, you know, being registered and protected, all of those become assets, right? So I think we, as we think about intellectual property and answer your question, we have to think about it just as much of an asset to our business as we would, again, you know, it's photos that we've created or it's courses that we've created or it's software that we've developed. They are assets that add to the ultimate bottom line, but they're different in that there's an enforcement aspect as well, right? I think people, when they think, well, I'm going to register a trademark and then nobody can use, you know, anything that's similar ever again, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. Certainly what you're going to want to do, whether it's with copyrights, trademarks, patents, as you have that issue, you have a choice that you can make. You can look at your nice registration certificate. You can hang it on the wall. You can put it in the file and just kind of rest on that. Or you can actually go out and enforce it. I know with course creators, you know, one of the things that just happens, you know, day in and day out is just this, this copy and paste of, you know, content all over the place. Copyright's actually a really effective mechanism for making that stop. There's something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And if you find somebody who is hosting your course, you're, there's, you know, every site is going to have a process and procedure by which you can take that down, you can have it removed. But again, knowing that is interesting, but you actually have to build that in as a process in your business if that's something that you're going to take advantage of. Similarly, if you have a brand name and you're selling a product and you've got it to market and you don't want anybody selling a similar type product with a similar type brand name, you're going to have to monitor that. And when you find people who are coming a little bit too close for comfort, you're going to have to do something about it. You know, and that's not, that doesn't mean going straight to court. Oftentimes people just kind of shrug and give up and they're like, well, wait, I'm not going to sue anybody because I don't have money to do it. And it's just a lost cause. There's a lot of things that you can do you know, before having to go to court to be able to try to enforce your rights. A lot of platforms like your Amazons, like your Etsy's, like your Ebay's have a, a built-in mechanism by which you can go and, and report people that you think are infringing. And they're largely, they're largely effective. They're not perfect, but they're largely effective. Similarly, if they if, let's say, you know, you don't have something like that, you're not selling a physical product, maybe you've got somebody that uh, has just bootlegged your videos, bootlegged your audio, bootlegged your photos. Again, most sites are going to have a digital millennium copyright uh, takedown process that you can avail yourself of. So great, take advantage of that. If all of that fails, there is always the the good old cease and desist letter uh, that you can you know kind of say, hey, listen, I found you online, and oh by the way, I have these sorts of rights, and here's how they're protected, and here's why I think that you are in the wrong here, and here's what I'm asking you to do. Oftentimes, that's good enough to kind of scare people away. People don't naturally want trouble uh, because, oh, by the way, they don't have money to go defend a lawsuit either. And so getting creative in that process of, of saying, hey, I have these rights. Now, what, how am I going to enforce it, right? And building whatever that workflow looks like for your business into your business processes, that's where you move from being a, a very average business to a very exceptional business because you're doing things that other people really aren't aware of. They just think, oh, I got this trademark. It's great. And then they just move on to the next day. It's part one of the equation. Part two is actually going out and doing something with it. Exactly. I think the, the enforcement aspect is what most people don't realize is, uh, is, is how you actually do the protection. Uh, there are thousands of knockoff Louis Vuitton handbags being sold on streets. Uh, and the fact that 
these companies have the patents and the trademarks and the copyrights, it doesn't physically protect the, the people trying to copy and trying to get away with it. Some companies obviously are uh, affected by it more than others, but you need to actually do something to, you, know, you cannot prevent someone copying you. It's just how you react to that then. Exactly, 100%. In some ways, you know, copying is kind of the, the best form of flattery, right? You must have done something right if somebody wants to copy what you've done, but that doesn't make it okay. And again, you know, I think there's this misconception that, oh, I have to be this really big company to be out to go and, and enforce my rights and kind of bat everybody away because these big companies are filing so many patents and so many trademarks and so many copyrights, and that's just what big companies do. But your example of Louis Vuitton was a really good one in that you know, Louis Vuitton, huge company, lots of money in the coffers, but yet you still have people on New York street corners kind of saying, hey, I can you know, go down this alley and I can sell you, sell you a bag on the cheap. Um, you know, they're not perfect, right? And there's never going to be a perfect in terms of enforcement, but I suspect Louis Vuitton has said, okay, listen, here's our enforcement plan. And for us, the best return on investment is kind of working through the online environment or making sure that, you know, we've got folks over in China, maybe going, you know, stopping goods at the port, you know, whatever it is for them to get the biggest bang for their buck. Yet, even so, with tons of money behind it, you're still going to have copycats. That's just the nature of business. And again, it's it, to some degree, that means you're successful. If you're not successful, nobody wants to copy you. But even small guys, again, I don't care if you, you take stock photos, you know, and put them up for, you know, for sale, whether you're creating courses, where you're doing stuff on Etsy, eBay, wherever. Um, there is still a process and procedure that you can implement in your business to enforce your rights in some form or fashion. It might start small at first and then grow and expand over time. That's okay. Simply by having an enforcement mechanism in the, the mix of your business, you're really going to set yourself apart from everybody else who's just kind of, you know, failing fast or moving and break, you know, fast and breaking things or hustling and grinding harder. All of those are good things, but real businesses make sure that they're enforcing their real rights. And that's a really, really important thing to do. It's a lot of things that, especially small entrepreneurs, just don't really think about early days. Now, some, uh, some aspects of intellectual property seem to be, uh, more enforceable than others and patents in many cases are held up as as the the the, the hardest to get but therefore most valuable um i will say though uh, over the last decade or so patents especially for uh online content seem to be getting less and less enforceable uh, and this is because of this history of patent trolls that really became an issue uh mm -hmm. over the last couple of decades where the government ended up stepping in and changing the rules to help the large companies which are producing this content but it seems to be at the detriment for the smaller creators the mm -hmm. startup firms who now not only need to produce the software but need to prove that they're the ones who produced the software and weren't inspired by anyone else what's your view on what happened with patent trolls and what the implications uh, are nowadays yeah, it's, it's really interesting that the notion of a patent, it has always kind of been this, this real most valuable aspect, aspect of intellectual property, because again, it's, it's a difficult thing to get, and the benefits are tremendous. I mean, having any sort of monopoly, uh, you know, 15 years or 20, I mean, that's, that's the only game in town for that period of time. That is, that's a lot of money uh, that, that's available to you if you're able to secure that. The, 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 the Supreme Court in the State Street Bank case years ago said, you know, listen, everything under the sun is patentable and just kind of opened up the doors to the patent office and everybody came running. And there's all sorts of what I would kind of say ridiculous patents that exist. And so in a lot of respects, kind of the shine has been taken off, off the patent side of things because just everything under the sun is patentable. Um, that said, I think it's really, there still is tremendous value in a patent. But it goes back to that earlier conversation we were having in terms of it's not just about the asset side of things, it's also about the enforcement side of things. So if you've made it through the patent gauntlet, which, oh, by the way, I mean, literally can take years to work through. You know, I, I gave you an example of just even a simple design patent. You're looking at a good year and a half uh, before it actually makes it through prosecution. You get into anything complicated, especially from the software side of things. You know, you're looking at, at you know, 
four, five, 10 years. I mean, it, it takes a long time to kind of be able to work through that process. You've got to be guns blazing, ready to jump on the back end of that day one. Okay, great. This patent is issued. How do we round everybody up? How do we preserve this market share? And what I see is that people spend, especially early, early stage companies, young companies, they spend so much money working through the prosecution process that it's not that they're not aware on the back end that they need to do anything. Sometimes they simply just run out of money. Sometimes they run out of willpower. Sometimes they run out of actually really being around kind of in the form and fashion that they thought they were. They jump down this patent road of just, this is going to be, you know, the thing that we can hang our hat on and is really going to make or break the company. But what they don't have right is the timeline that it takes or the amount of capital that it's going to take, not only from securing the patent, but also enforcing it. Now, you know, a lot of sellers online, I'm thinking specifically in the e-com space, to kind of balance the equities, we are seeing larger platforms work to address this problem. Amazon last year, understanding that, you know, you were having big companies that were just patenting everything and coming in and just squashing everybody. Amazon, who gets a lot of salt there in its way in terms of, oh, it's not seller friendly and they're only for the big guys. And there's some degree of truth in that. But um, they said, listen, that's a big problem. That's not a great thing. So they actually spun up a process. It's called the neutral patent evaluation process. And effectively what happens is someone with a patent can enroll their patent in this process. And every time that they see what they perceive to be an infringement, there's a deposit made of $5,000. Amazon then goes out and goes to the alleged infringer and says, hey, these guys say they have a patent and your item is infringing their patent. If you wanna protest this, you can do so, but you've got to deposit $5,000. And then we're gonna send everybody over to a neutral uh, mediator and effectively decide the case. They're gonna arbitrate the issue and whoever wins gets their 5,000 back and whoever loses, you know, we're gonna keep the $5,000 to pay the arbitrator. It's a nice solution, not only from patent holders, right? Because they can, you know, $5,000, you don't really even get into court for $5,000. It's a very easy way to actually enforce your rights in the platform. $5,000 is enough of a pain point for someone to, to kind of say that, that's alleged to be infringing to say, oh, well, I really need to be certain about this or, oh man, I need to spin this down. I was in the wrong. I'm just going to go the other way. Again, not a perfect process, but I really... You know, kind of back to file share. You know, I mean, Napster, the whole internet could have just collapsed in and on, on itself, but it did. It evolved and it changed, and you had other things that kind of rose up to take its place. And I think we're largely all better off for it. I, I think technology like the internet and technology like platforms like Amazon through a neutral patent evaluation process, they there is the hope that there can be this balancing of equities. It's not going to be perfect for every industry, but it does exist. And so, you know, yeah, the shine's been taken off patents a little bit. Yeah, you've got big companies that are coming in and being bullies, but you're also seeing, you know, opportunities for small companies, entrepreneurs specifically to, to fight back a little bit in a meaningful way. Rob, I've really enjoyed our discussion so far. Uh, we're coming up on time, but I've got probably my most popular question when it comes to intellectual property, uh, especially from innovators, creators, and uh, people who have a lot of ideas. I get asked quite a lot, how can I prevent someone stealing my idea? And it's, it's, a, it's a question that really frustrates me, but I wanted to get your take on, uh, is there a way to prevent someone stealing an idea if you haven't done anything with the idea yet? It, it, there is, uh, but I think it requires a little bit of creativity. So I think one of the traps that uh, you know, creators fall into is to the extent that they understand the nuance of intellectual property, right? They understand the nuance of trademarks and copyrights and patents and trade secrets. Um, they treat them like silos. They treat them like buckets, right? Oh, I have to, I can only trademark this, or I can only copyright this, or I can only patent this, right? I think the smartest entrepreneur is one that really treats their, their creative whatever, their it, and, and they, they treat intellectual property as wrapping paper. You know, like I think of a, you know, the, the most beautiful present I've ever received under the Christmas tree. It might be this, this lovely present and it's got wrapping paper and it has bows and it has ribbons and it has tags. And, you know, of course you want to dress up this amazing gift that you want to, you know, give to somebody that you love, right? The things that we create are no different, right? So you have to look at the it that you've created and ask yourself, okay, what aspects of this can be trademarked? 
great, let me do that. Let me put that wrapping paper around it. Okay, is there anything that's copyrightable here? Do if I made sure that I own that copyright? Okay, great. Let me put that bow on top of it. Patent. Okay, I've got some choices. Design patent, utility patent. Which one is this? Okay, I'm going to do that now. Right between, you know, really treating intellectual property as wrapping paper as opposed to just buckets that you're sticking your your creative it in uh, can get really really interesting. I think that sort of aspect, that sort of approach, can lead to some really interesting results. In the absence of that, let's say it really is, it's just something that's batting around in your, your it is just in your mind and you, you haven't put pen to paper really and you haven't gone to market and it's just really this personal thing, but you're sharing it with some folks. Get a proper non-disclosure agreement in place. Um, all too often, especially with creatives, we just, we wanna share, we wanna collaborate, we wanna bounce ideas back and forth. To the extent that you're really worried about somebody kind of taking your idea and running with it and commercializing it or using it in a way that you wouldn't want, it seems kind of formal and it seems it might seem like a little bit of overkill, but having just a basic confidentiality agreement in place to at least create a private sphere where you can have those conversations so that you can then later preserve the opportunity to wrap your idea in wrapping paper and put a bow on it, add some jingle bells, whatever it is, right? Um, you know, that's a simple, practical thing that you can do. Okay, Rob, I've really enjoyed our discussion. Uh, if people want to find out more about you or your work, what's the best place they can go to find out more? Yeah, sure. Uh, they can head on over to superherolegal.com. Uh, you know, we have a guide there that talks to all the things that I've talked about here. Uh, as it relates to intellectual property. So really, really helpful, certainly, you know, tailored towards the e-com space, but all the concepts there are very applicable to, you know, course creators and photographers and bloggers and writers. All of the, all the concepts are the same, regardless of kind of what you do in your business. So head on over to superherolegal.com, download the guide. Uh, it'll at least put you on the right track as you think about protecting your creations. Perfect. I'll make sure to get that link down in the description below. Rob, it's been wonderful speaking with you and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. Thanks so much. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share and subscribe and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to you, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.